hello everybody and welcome. I'm Simone Arabutti and I'm gonna be moderating the panel. I am part, I'm here uh, on behalf of Tech Workers Coalition that is an international organization that unionizes tech workers and in general deals with technopolitics inside tech companies and especially uh, on behalf of Reversing Works that is a new organization being formed uh, that uh, deals more specifically on the topics we're going to talk about today. We do technical investigations of gig uh, workers platform mostly and even though we are open to different kinds of yeah, uh, targets, let's say, in order to inform um, policymakers, but it's also mostly unions and workers collectives on like and bridge the gap, the informational gap between the companies and workers that at the moment is a huge element of oppression and violation of workers' rights, as we are going to see today. Um, yeah, we also look for projects and collaborations. So uh, if you see something that sparked your interest today, come to me and we might talk about it. Um, yeah, and today we, are, we have a, um, a round of panelists that are all involved in this, uh, let's say, ecosystem of organizations trying to bridge the, gap, the informational gap between workers and tech companies. And without further ado, I will leave the word to them to introduce themselves, and then we can get to the content, to the juice of the panel. Uh, yes, thank you very much for, for joining us. My name is Aida Ponce del Castillo. I am a senior researcher at the European Trade Union Institute here in Brussels. I'm a legal scholar and I have been working on issues around technology and law for many years. And of course, my focus is worker protection. Um, yeah, hello, I'm Justin Nogrede. I work at the Friedrich Ebers Stiftung's Competence Center on the future of work, very long name, German organization. Before that, I worked at the Foundation for European Progressive Studies, also on digital tech policy. And before that, I worked half a decade in the European Commission on digital single market stuff. Like Aida, I have a bit of a legal policy background, and I'm always a bit envious of all the tech experts here in the room and very interested to connect because like the work that we do with uh, unions and workers often revolves around the question, how can we get more tech expertise uh, you know, in our projects? How can we reach out to digital rights activists, many of whom are here in the room? So I hope that this panel can be like a small step to also you know, bridge the worker movement and the digital rights activist movement uh, to join up with our expertise and uh, competences. Thanks, looking forward. Hello, uh, my name is John Shafak and I come from Worker Info Exchange, where we investigate and advocate for the data rights of platform workers, sorry. Um, I'm going to be talking a bit more about what we do, so I'm going to keep this intro short. Uh, over to you, Simone. Yeah, I don't know if Sana is connected. Um, otherwise, she can introduce herself later if, if she joins. Otherwise, no. I'm, I'm here. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, hi, yes, hi. Um, yeah, um, yeah, it's too bad I'm not there, but I'm glad that at least this possibility worked out. Um, yeah, I'm Sana Ahmed. I am a, I'm an academic researcher. I'm based in Berlin. Um, I'm interested in the global economy of digitalization, so I research um, work related to yeah, digitalization of work, automation. Um, I'm a researcher at Helmut Schmidt University in Hamburg, but I'm also an associate at the Weizenbaum Institute and the WZB Berlin Social Science Center. Um, yeah, I mean, I have been looking at work in global value chains and and the role of state and how that sort of, you know, those trade relations, the power asymmetries, how that structures, um, structures workplace conditions and possibilities for bargaining. But I also look at, uh, at migrant work, uh, migrant work in Germany. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. So um, let's start. And uh, we are here, like this panel is a bit a different topic than what people in privacy spaces are used to. And um, maybe, maybe not, but in our understanding, like the, the topic of worker rights is, are, are often overlooked in these spaces and it might not be 
so obvious why our privacy in, in theory and in practice connects with these with collective rights of workers because they are usually perceived as like very separate spaces. So I will ask Justin to a bit like explain a bit what's the overlap and how uh, yeah why we are here today also because this is a justification for for, for the panel itself. All right, thanks, uh, Simona, for the introduction. And as I said, I don't have many technical <laughs> skills, so let me do the broad picture here. And I think the big picture when we talk about uh, workers' rights and like data rights, or perhaps more narrowly privacy, is that, uh, and these are not my words, but the words of like US law professor Brishan Rogers, is that digital technology, digital tools are right now used by many employers, frankly, as a tool of, I would almost say, class warfare or class domination, right? So when you talk about digital tools that employers use, I mean, they use them to, for instance, displace workers through automation. They use them to kind of like de-skill uh, various tasks to make labor cheaper. They use them to suppress uh, labor organizing or prevent it, to physically separate workers from one another. They use it to, of course, surveil workers ever, ever more, which links back to privacy questions, of course. And they also just use it to basically deny a whole bunch of workers their basic legal rights. And this leads then to like a lot of like, I don't want to say less skilled workers, but people like on the bottom of the labor market being subjected to more and more market discipline and kind of a Darwinian struggle. Whereas on the other side, there's a lot of like rent uh, generating innovations really and more control over data that's being hoarded and concentrated at the top in a few hands and I think that's a key power imbalance that is very visible in the gig economy and we'll talk about that uh, more in this panel and and this is something that also at uh, the FES Compton Center we're very concerned with and we try to redress that power imbalance and when you talk about like redressing that power imbalance between employers or platforms and workers on the other hand then you talk about data. You talk about knowledge, which is data. You talk about how workers can get a handle on that data. Now, in the workplace, this is often about collective access to data, right? Because a worker, he wants to know not just uh, the, you know, his individual, his or her individual data is being gathered about him or her, but you know, you want to have a more broader picture of you know, the salary structure in a firm, like chances for promotion, discovering patterns of discrimination, finding out how work is allocated, for instance, in the platform economy. And for that, you need more collective access uh, and not just you know, personal data individual. This is, of course, difficult in the gig economy because, as you probably know, many gig workers are often falsely classified as uh, self-employed. And the sector is very new, which makes it difficult also to organize. And platforms are organized in such a way that it's very difficult for workers to come together. And that all means that they often don't have um, access to basic worker rights, like you know, collective bargaining, um, like co-determination of new technology in a workplace and decisions around that, collective information rights. They often just don't exist for platform workers. So then the question is, what can we do? And then for me, one obvious question is, um, or one obvious uh, piece of uh, legal technology is the general data protection regulation. Because those rights, those data protection rights also hold for platform workers. And um, Simone, you already mentioned in the introduction that um, the GDPR and privacy is often about individual questions. How can we link that to uh, workplace questions which are collective? Um, indeed, that's tricky because the GDPR is very much focused on individual rights, which I think is a mistake. But I don't think that the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, is useless for workers. Right? There's a lot of interesting rights and options. Right? You have data subject access requests, so workers can you know, request information that employers have about them. There's certain protections against automated decision making, uh, autom automated firing and hiring. Um, there's also, for instance, obligations on employers to carry out data protection impact assessments, and they actually have to consult workers on that when it's high risk, so around performance uh, management, scoring systems, etc., and so on. Um, so there are a lot of potential options within the GDPR. Of course, we all know that the problem here is enforcement, and yeah? those laws are simply not enforced, the GDPR is not enforced. Um, at FES, we had a workshop last year private workshop with also data protection authorities in a private capacity. And what we understood from them is that they simply have no manpower to do proactive uh, enforcement. They just rely on complaints or data that's really being handed to them to do something with that. 
but they have absolutely no scope to carry out uh, proactive investigations, although they should by law. And that then brings us, I think, a little bit to the question of today's panel, because that means that it's super important to look at other options to make good on GDPR rights, like reverse engineering to get a handle on those data, to get like evidence of infringements, and also to do private enforcement if the collective enforcement from data protection authorities is simply non-existent or just not functioning as we would like it to. And here, I think I'm really interested to the discussion in the panel because, um, so at FES, after the workshop we did last year, the conclusion was we need more technical expertise, we need private enforcement. And then there's a lot of open questions, right? There's questions around what kind of strategies should we employ? Is it useful to create kind of like more competences and capacities to do like mass uh, data subject access requests um, and to follow up on that, you know, complain to DPAs and then perhaps based on those individual uh, like troves of data to create a collective picture of what's going on but I don't know enough if that's useful, but perhaps the panelists know that. Um, second is, for instance, to see, okay, can we do maybe strategic litigation, like Mark Schrems has done very successfully, but more in the consumer area? Is this something we can employ in the work area as well? And then third, is actually the GDPR too much focus on individual rights? Is it just not effective enough? Is it too cost and resource intensive? And should we just use reverse engineering of um, data that workers already have available irregardless of what's possible under the GDPR and build the technical infrastructure for that. So in essence, uh, I want to close there. I have a lot of questions, so I'm kind of egoistically using this panel uh, to gather more information myself for my future work. Thanks. Thank you, Justin. I will ask now Aida to dig a bit deeper into what Justin introduced because uh, we are seeing the rise of an ecosystem of organizations that is bringing together, mm, let's say, very different actors that are some more traditional like unions and policymakers and sometimes even political parties in countries that are lucky enough to have some traction there, uh, but also new uh, kinds of organizations like reversing works or workers in exchange that uh, try to bridge the gap of expertise, especially multidisciplinary expertise. And so I would ask Aida to maybe um, portray, like explain from her perspective what she see, how she sees this ecosystem growing and why it's necess necessary to, you know, address these, these topics with, uh, with new approaches that are sometimes technical, like they bring together like legal expertise, technical expertise, sociological expertise, uh, in a way that maybe 20 years ago unions or didn't really you know care about to engage this with these technological topics so yeah who are the actors and what kind of expertise do they bring to the table and how they collaborate on the ground to produce uh, the impact we like Justin was talking about and that we will talk about for the rest of the panel uh, thank you Simone and Justin so from my perspective and I work only in the EU area so I I might I don't know what's happening in the rest of the world uh, but I think that GDPR is a way and it should be used by unions our workers in defending their digital rights and there's a lot of their of of, of resources in using that the issue is that uh, Labor unions or workers are really more, well, I will speak about labor unions. Labor unions know really well labor law and social policies because that's their job. It's the job is to defend workers on an employment setting. And there's a lot already, health and safety issues, psychosocial issues, pension systems, the negotiating wages, negotiating all sorts of things related to employment. But they also have now uh, the, the, the moral <laughs> obligation to look at other types of uh, areas in which they also need to be negotiating in behalf of workers in improving their working conditions. That means uh, issues related to the just transition, uh, environmental stuff, environmental topics, and technology issues or digital issues. And data protection and privacy, it's and fundamental rights, of course, is part of that. And all these three dimensions are interlinked. It's not just social rights, environmental rights, and digital issues or digital fundamental rights. Everything, when we speak about platform work, for example, everything is interconnected. Everything is about what type of business models are these platforms running or 
are based on. It's about whether they are really having a sustainable or um, blueprint in economy or in the labor market, and whether they really protect source workers' rights and employment rules, or they are abide by employment rules. So everything is it's in interconnected. Since 2017, I have been trying to convince trade unions to use GDPR or to at least open it and read it because it has beautiful principles and beautiful rights that they can use on their own in order to um, defend them and to bring more transparency and respect at the workplace by the employer. The fact is that they are, I believe that they are a little bit shy or um, just naive in using GDPR because, as I explained at the beginning, it's not their natural field or their natural environment. But when I say uh, there is evidence that GDPR works, despite that there is a lack of, of enforcement, which is also true for labor authorities, they also have lack in inspecting workplaces because workplaces have to be inspected all the time in all EU uh, countries. Uh, they also suffer from uh, human resource uh, expertise and time and overlord. It's the same story as data protection authorities. And that is not an excuse to say that GDPR doesn't work or cannot be enforced. But we already have evidence of various cases showing that GDPR or data protection authorities can act or can be instrumental in issues that relate to the employment setting, even though data protection authorities are not labor authorities and do not have this expertise to assess whether the data of workers is being hampered in certain employment conditions, they do have the data protection expertise in, in, in looking at what digital rights and fundamental rights are being hampered. And those few investigations that some data protection authorities have carried out have been successfully um, finalized in, in hefty fines. The biggest one that I really like a lot and that I have been speaking about this in other privacy camps is the fine uh, of the Hamburg DPA on H&M Service Center in Hamburg, which uh, ended up in finding the managers or the owners or the, <laughs> the managers of H&M at 35 million euros and compensating workers because their data was being extracted and used to have uh, talks like, oh, I know that you were on holiday to, to Madrid. How was your holiday, Mary? Like, you just, the manager was asking questions, very private questions to workers, like, why were you on sick leave? <laughs> They don't supposed to know this private stuff. And thanks to that, the workers were compensated. Similar fines were, have been done in, in, in Germany, in Finland, in Norway, in, in other EU countries. And I show these examples to workers and trade unions to say, guys, GDPR works. Now, uh, that's one way of getting through exercising GDPR rights. But we also find it very difficult to, to exercise these rights when they, it comes to complex workplaces or just different environments, for example, the platform or the gig economy. And um, Claudio Agosti, uh, one of Simon's colleagues and his team, who, is, who are engineers, started to develop methodologies in order to observe the algorithms. And they tried this methodology of reverse engineering in one single um, gig worker in, who worked in one food delivery platform in Spain, uh, sorry, in Italy, called Fodinho. Fodinho. This food delivery platform is associated to Glovo in Spain, which is a little bit bigger. So it's in Italy and in Spain, this case is, is known as the Glovo Fodinho case. Uh, thanks to uh, observing th uh, the algorithm through the app of the worker, which was a technique that was employed during a, 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 uh, three years, because of course you can imagine it's groundbreaking technique, it's never been done and it's the first time we look into an app 
uh, an algorithm of a uh, delivery worker, it was blunt. The evidence was incredibly stunning. We knew or we know that apps are very intrusive, but we know now that thanks to that, this app of Fodinho could look, this algorithm could look into the time, working time, which is okay you know, to know how much how many hours you work in your company, but the app looked to the time beyond working hours, meaning resting time, off time, sleeping time. So all the times were calculated, something that is not legal for employers to know. It also knew when the phone was on and off, um, the speed, of course, and all sorts of parameters that the rider didn't know that they were collected. Moreover, uh, all riders know that there is a score thanks to their speeding delivery, their, their food or their um, uh, uh, rides. But besides from that normal visible score, there was another hidden score that it was a ride score in which the real uh, rider was um, profiled and measured. So <laughs> it was having two double uh, sorts of evidence uh, and it, it was just appalling to see that. What did we do with that uh, technical evidence? But it was so important for us that um, this group of, of engineers delivered their report in order to support the claim of the Fodinho Global Riders in the court of Olo in, the, in Bologna in Italy. And thanks to this piece of evidence or this report, the DPA read it and said, thank you very much for the, uh, giving this for free <laughs> because they didn't do the work. The, the, the work was done by, by Claudia's team with money from someone else. And, um, and that helped to the DPA to condemn Fodinho. And then we have another case. That is huge because we know what the algorithm has and measures. We know that it can serve DPAs. We know that we have a lot of information thanks to a technical investigation, and that gives more knowledge to not only the workers, but the, but the whole labor movement, including trade unions. So I think that this type of collaboration between sociological researchers, legal researchers, privacy people, and of course technical people can bring a lot. It's just levering so much um, the, um, the, the, the power that we can have and helping the PAs in doing their work. Thank you very much. Um, uh, in the room, we also have another person that participated to this project, Alessandro Polidoro, that is here in the first row. If you have more questions about the project, it's also like the legal, like it was involved in the legal side of it. Now, um, thank you, Aida. Let's move on. Like so far, except for this uh, specific example that we mentioned last, uh, we, we stayed on a systemic level of the whole issue. And I would like to ask Sana and Jensu a bit more uh, about you know the lived reality of conducting these investigations, uh, starting from Sana, that um, focused on a kind of worker that is, let's say, mentioned less often than gig workers that seem to be the only kind of surveilled workers these days, and it's it's not the case. And she worked with content moderators, and uh, maybe you can tell us a bit more about their working conditions, the issues they face that are to some degree different and to some degree similar to uh, you know, gig workers, and what did you, what did you do? Like, what, uh, what is your experience in this? Um, yeah, no, thanks for asking this question. I think uh, what might also be useful for the discussion here and what is a common thread running through gig economy, but also the kind of traditional uh, traditional service work that content moderation is in terms of what I've studied is is surveillance, um, you know, which uh, and and algorithmic control. So surveillance forms a forms an important part of of algorithmic control. And in, in gig economy, you know, we've seen, for example, Ida was also pointing out in terms of how you know work is uh, uh, 
work is directed to workers, you know, and, and a lot of other sort of like this um, um, automated sort of uh, task allocation, etc., which is again collected in terms of uh, the data collected uh, from workers. Um, so what I observed was that um, this high degrees of surveillance allows platform companies, I, I studied companies like Meta, Google, etc., to record on one hand worker data regarding their productivity, you know, so time taken, um, you know, the amount of tasks that they do, etc., uh, but also on the other hand to collect data from, uh, from the users of the platform. So those who don't know what content moderation is, it's the cleaning of social media platforms. It's the managing of the content on social media platforms. So, you know, in, 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 in this kind of work, platforms have been continuously collecting more and more information over the years from, from users uh, regarding content that violates the standards, right? So information such as who posted the content, which platform policy it violates, uh, at which exact second of a video, if it's a YouTube video, did the violation happen? And then if you're sort of, um, you know, reporting a content as a user under the NetStege, the Netfo Network Enforcement Act, then there's more sort of information required by the platform. So this is all collected by the companies and then streamlined as work tasks and, um, you know, in terms of automated uh, uh, direction of this, this flagged content to workers. And what this also does is that it limits the reliance on workers. So, so the companies don't really have to rely so much on the workers and reduce the the errors or the mistakes that might uh, that might happen uh, for the companies. So, but at the same time, platform companies also have to rely on the workers. You know, even with all of this technical control, um, 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 they cannot completely rely on user provided information or the software. And there's just things are continuously changing in terms of how platform users mm -hmm. are interacting mm -hmm. with the platform, etc. Right? But this constant pressure to perform on the worker on the workers negatively affects their, their possibilities for taking initiatives. So just a quick example of what does it mean in terms of taking initiatives for content moderators, you know, they, um, there are sometimes policies like these standards that uh, that do not apply to all kinds of content that have been posted, then workers have to think. Of course, this all has to be done within very limited amount of time, um, um, but the constant pressure, the constant monitoring creates a lot, of, uh, a lot of pressure on them. Surveillance also plays additional functions than just sort of directing work to workers. Um, it creates this individualized performance data, which some of you have already sort of mentioned that is used then for rewarding or disciplining them you know so this includes career promotions um you know bonuses and incentives sending them to other shifts or even threatening their employment but what is interesting to see here that how this data generated from the software is used to create an illusion of objectivity of managerial objectivity you know before these updates so what we were studying and i'll uh, we'll probably discuss this later in this panel. Um, I use this sort of uh, design thinking technique, which we also call reverse engineering in a certain way. I'll explain that later. But uh, but there were constant there are constant updates happening in the work software. Um, and you know before workers could contest uh, from with their management, hey, um, you know why am I being sort of like um, um, you know uh, why do why why is my performance being scored like this uh, or that uh, before there were were all this performance metrics generated by the software. So it also creates that illusion of objectivities. Of course, this acceptance is also short-lived as workers also see the mistakes of the workers, right, of the, of the software, right, such as the software is not recording their uh, productivity hours properly. You know, sometimes they get the wrong content in their queue, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They also see that there's restrictions on on workers, um, you know, emotional management techniques. In content moderation, there is uh, high degrees of distressing content, such as violent content, sexually abusive content, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and what they would do is sometimes they would, uh, they would um, use YouTube or SoundCloud, et cetera, in the background to help them sort of uh, manage with it, but, you know, listening to music for alleviating their stress. But this was again restricted as well in these updates. So workers are seeing uh, that, you know, there are all these changes happening. Um, so this, this sort of acceptance is also sort of short-lived, if you can call it internalization of control through algorithms is also, also short-lived. I've talked here about the use of surveillance and capital la labor relations, but I also want to just briefly refer to its use in outsourcing and interfirm relations in global value chains. Now, in, in, in an outsourcing relationship, the clients or the lead firms or the platforms, as they're called, um, they're dependent on the subcontractors, right? Whether in the case of Germany, 
company that we observe how Meta outsourced to another company or where I studied in India, uh, how the, um, these companies have been outsourcing to their partners. They depend, these lead firms depend on, on their subcontractors to meet, to meet their standards and ensure labor productivity. Um, and so the use of highly monitoring technologies, their own software allows them not just to monitor the work of the workers, but also monitor the subcontractors management. Right. And this information is very important for the agreements they form with these subcontractors, you know, in terms of the service level agreements they form. So in terms of negotiating their project contracts, in terms of the payments, because most of these uh, project contracts are based on price based agreements, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and again, this is also then it opens up a scope for possibility for for regulation here um, in terms of pl uh, these platform companies or these lead firms cannot say we don't know what's happening, uh, uh, you know, in, in an outsourced uh, uh, workplace because they know, you know, there's high degrees of transparency and traceability available to these platform companies through these through these work software. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um... Now, uh, I will ask Jensu to do the same exercise and tell us a bit about um, the investigation of Workers Info Exchange, that is uh, the organization she works with. And what did you find? What did you do? What did you, what were sure. you looking for? Thanks, Simone. Um, yeah, both Aida and Justin have talked about extensively about the need to use the GDPR, which is what we do. So I'll try to give some examples from our work to explain what that looks like. So all of our investigations start with the exercise of workers' data rights. So what that means is we make subject access requests which try to retrieve the information, the data that is collected from companies, uh, sorry, collected by companies from the workers, um, as well as data that is observed and inferred about them, as well as information relating to automated decision making, uh, that they may have been subject to. And there's um, two dimensions of this, uh, as Justin touched upon, the individual and collective. Um, one thing to add is that when we retrieve the data, we try to build on it with more technical analyses, of, such as you know, analyzing the data that we retrieve. Um, so the goal of this effort is to expose the algorithmic control that is exerted over workers, um, as well as the conditions, the qualities and methods of that control. Um, so the short answer to what we're looking for is we want to understand how algorithmic management was exercised and what the consequences of it were. Um, so the individual level of this is often dealing with the resolution of individual disputes. Um, in these cases, we're usually dealing with deactivations or suspensions, uh, which we take to be unfair dismissals because they result from uh, automated processes that platforms give very vague explanations of or don't explain at all. Um, and they tend to be really strong indicators of the kinds of control that companies are exerting and trying to, to obfuscate. Um, so, for, exa for example, we might have a case where a worker is dismissed for not making deliveries fast enough, uh, but they won't be told how slow they were or how fast they were expected to be. Um, and this goes back, of course, to the question of companies wanting to appear as though they're not controlling the workers so as to avoid their employer obligations, so as to misclassify the workers. Um, but potentially also what it points to is that workers are being driven towards unsafe work through hidden performance metrics and targets. Um, we're seeing this with one particular company at the moment uh, who are guarding this information very closely and they have been responding to our requests for delivery estimates, estimated times of delivery by arguing that uh, these are not the personal data of the workers, even though the workers are being directly evaluated against this metric and being dismissed as a result of it. Um, and I think this is a good example of needing to take that multidisciplinary approach that we mentioned earlier in this conversation, because you have to deal with this legal argumentation 
you have to dismantle these arguments and then you have to analyze the data once you're able to retrieve it to uh, demonstrate precisely how a worker has been mistreated. Um, but going back to the individual versus collective question, um, the, the individual worker obviously requires an explanation of which deliveries were slow, by how much, and that they'll want to offer their perspective on why that might have been. And a subject access request facilitates the retrieval of this information. It sometimes prompts a review that should have taken place in the first place. But the collective dimension of this is that when you have lots of workers demanding this information, that data in aggregate can stand to form a very accurate picture of how work is organized on that platform, what the conditions of work are. So that can be, as I think Justin already mentioned, um, well, first of all, hidden performance targets, as we, as we discussed, but also how work is allocated, how pay is set, whether these are done fairly, whether there's any profiling or personalization involved in these. Um, whether these match companies' statements and assertions about how they're conducting their business. Um, so these, these, this collectively used can be a very, very powerful tool. Um, and that's what we're, those are the kinds of questions we're trying to answer as we work towards the collectivization of worker data. Um, finally, uh, another aspect of our work uh, that might be considered another methodology and already mentioned as well is, is our strategic litigation work where we try to advance these issues in the courts, um, which, which are also quite interesting in that they can force disclosures that we're not able to obtain through regular DSAR submissions. Um, we had one very interesting case in London, for example, where a driver was dismissed with an allegation of account sharing, which Uber concluded from the detection of two, uh, two devices registered with the driver account in two different locations at around the same time. Um, so what had happened in this instance was the driver had lent his personal phone to his son for the day, which, by the way, is a very common feature of how workers engage with technology. They're tied to this device all day. They naturally want to have divisions between work and personal life, and, and they assume that they can do with their personal devices what they want. Um, but, uh, and I mean, this is, this is an interesting issue because there are some really, really striking contradictions in how, how companies advise and guide workers as to you know, device maintenance and account security. You have companies saying in the same breath, don't share your login credentials with anyone, while at the same time telling them exactly to do that in order to engage a substitute, for example. Um, but going back to this case, uh, this driver brought his case to us for us to investigate, and we asked for a data set called Driver Online Offline, which is pretty self-explanatory. It shows when the driver has gone online to make themselves available for work. And it will show this for all of the devices registered with the account. So we looked at this, uh, we looked at this data, and we didn't see any indication that the second device had been online. And ultimately, what was revealed was that Uber was collecting additional, additional data on attempts to go online. So um, all interactions with the app, um, all taps, all presses of a button, all scrolls of a screen were being tracked and, and being used against the driver um, in, in this instance, and which, which found him facing, facing an allegation of fraud. Um, and I think that's, that's a really strong example of um, surveillance that is, you know, present on these platforms as well. Um, I'll stop there, I, but uh, yeah, hopefully that gives you an idea of what we do. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, we, uh, I mean, uh, so far we mentioned, um, few, like, the idea that there are different approaches to investigate these opaque systems. And Sana mentioned a specific one that she calls design thinking, and I will ask her to, uh, you know, elaborate a bit on what that means. How does it look like? 
Um, yeah, I think before I I can explain what I mean by by design thinking, I would like to speak a bit about transparency. And of course, we've been talking about surveillance practices, but also how, and I think this is also what was mentioned in the beginning, these, these industrial pra practices of secrecy, um, you know, by these companies, um, how difficult they make it um, for, for researchers and, and trade unionists and other members of the public to really understand the processes of production and, and the working conditions therein. But it's also, also used by the management to hide several important aspects of work, again, that was mentioned. And in, 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 in this scenario, when we started thinking about using this design thinking technique, we focused on the on the work software, which which takes an important role in this equation. Although when uh, when I studied in uh, studied uh, the workplaces in India, um, there were also physical cameras installed, which were also collecting data uh, on on workers and how workers were also internalizing this surveillance. Anyway, so the use of uh, the work software allowed management here in Germany, but also in India, to hide several aspects from from workers. I think the most important aspect was how these software are embedded with the machine learning software, with the machine learning tool, um, how it functions. So some workers were told there is a machine learning tool. Um, it is learning some of the aspects from your work, but not really how it's really codifying um, uh, the, 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 the labor knowledge, you know, how it's really recording all those different aspects of, of, of what workers were doing. And this was again in Germany and in India that was happening. So there's a lot of sort of like obfuscation around this machine learning tool, but also, you know, in terms of what is really happening with this work, um, there is a general sort of, you know, obscurity around work processes and especially when it's outsourced work processes, but what happens when a content moderator sort of like tags or moderates a certain piece of content, where does it go? Is there another team, you know, sort of connected? Is there another sort of like work place in another geography connected. So it's all very obfuscated. There's just a work software that you're working with. Um, and also for which all purposes the worker data is used. In this software, there is also the chat tool. So all the communication, informal and internal communication within teams happens through this chat tool. So workers are really restricted from moving around within the workplace to go and speak to the, each other. So you don't have this sort of, you know, you know, meeting at the sort of water um, drinking space or coffee space where workers could talk. Everything is very monitored. And this chat tool also includes the team leaders, the supervisors, right? So there's also that kind of sort of presence, but they don't really know um, um, you know, so there's some kind of internalization of this monitoring, but they don't really know what is what is really happening. But again, you know, I mean, I think um, workers are the ones engaging with the with the user interface of the software and they know about the short faults of the software when it doesn't work, how it works. So this we observed already that workers were very sort of like, you know, knowledgeable about, uh, you know, how to use that software. So together with my colleagues in Berlin, we tapped on this aspect and studied the content moderation software at a, at a German company subcontracted by Meta. Um, given that we had no access to the uh, company because content moderation is extremely, extremely confidential for various different reasons. I can talk about it in the discussion um, if anybody wants to know, but the reasons what companies possessed, but um, we had no, so we had no access to the company and any information about the workers. So we used the design thinking technique um, to, to try to understand the design of the, of the human machine interaction of the work software. We call this as reverse engineering as well of the labor process in the sense that you know we don't have access to the software but we try to deconstruct how the software functions from a from a worker's perspective so what we did was we made use of work uh, group workshops where we were able to render the detailed model of the of the software's user interface you know with its different pages right like uh, what happens when you open the software is the name of the platform company anywhere visible which it wasn't even though they're working for meta there's nowhere anywhere written uh, that it's facebook or meta 
uh, you know, where are the multiple menu options located, right? Where is the time tracker located? How are they changing? Where is, where is the different location and functions of button, right? Like, how is the task really coming? Um, you know, are, are there restrictions on going back to a previous task? What happens when you don't sort of like, you know, uh, do your task within the average handling time? Uh, can you forward the task? What about the chat tool? So we would we try to render different wireframes, um, design frames for all of these, and we would ask uh, for workers to draw them out uh, and send it to uh, send it to us. So by UK, making use of this method, not only were we able to access previously inaccessible information about how dynamic this work software is, how like every week there is an update uh, in the software um, with its regular changes in terms of controlling workers workers' discretion over their tasks and time. So this is really where, uh, you know, it's changing, uh, changing the conditions for workers uh, in terms of their tasks and time. But also this, this, this kind of technique helped us to facilitate discussions with workers around why and how the software was designed, was designed with control as the core part of it, right? So we brought people together and we we thought it together. And I think this is where it actually gets crucial regarding the labor struggle, you know? So most workers found the control as excessive and non-productive. And they were talking about if the software changes were really necessary. And again, um, you know, why we used a group setting for this is because it's actually difficult to remember aspects of a software. I mean, if you use a particular software interface and you might forget a, uh, uh, many different elements of it, even though you've been using it so many times. So it helped to to work together with these different people. We also had a design thinking expert who had previously used this uh, this technique. Um, yeah, so during these discussions, some workers also suggested ways to make their work more efficient. You know, this includes, they said, well, we could have certain zoom in and zoom out tools so that we could look at the details. We could, uh, you know, access the uh, policies and things, resources better, or how the content moderation um, software needs to become more user friendly. What are really the expectations of the of from the moderator? So I think the point was that how can the why was why was there so much control? Workers were conscious of it, if you can call that. They were conscious about it. They were speaking about it through this technique. And how could it be? How could it be more? F made more efficient in terms of being more friendly towards the workers, um, uh, their interest, and also making work more efficient. At the same time, I, again, I want to briefly say that you know this we have to understand the limitations of of this of this con you know the transformation of this consciousness into resistance. You know, so if, if there is this consciousness, why doesn't it transform into resistance? These are also workers who are. Um, all migrants. Um, um, a few of those workers were also in the process of applying for asylum. So there were, there are also these structural conditions that affect the workers and their conditions in the sense that everybody was really worried about what would happen um, if if they would resist and what would it mean for their for their visas, etc. Um, so yeah, I think this should also be taken into account. Thank you very much. Very insightful um, answer. I would say, uh, into design thinking. And now we'll pass back to Jensu, um, because so far we have been talking, we've been focusing on GDPR, but I would like to ask her if there are other regulations that might hold similar potential and how it differs from using GDPR. Well, um, I think, you know, a lot of us here have been following the platform work directive quite closely, though that's not yielded great results so far. Um, I think, and I, I'm aware that you're mindful of the time, Simone, so I'm going to try to keep it short. It's not quite the time to abandon the GDPR, um, in my opinion. I think we're making great progress, as highlighted by AIDA as well. We're seeing victories in the courts. We're seeing hefty fines being dished out. Um, I think a lot more workers are engaging these rights. Um, our, in our experience of doing this for the past three years, our interactions with the companies have changed dramatically. Um, you know, where they once questioned our right to represent workers, ignored our requests, um, ignored our communications, we, we now get a much more professional response across the board. So I think these are all things to be heartened by because um, if the journey we've been on with the GDPR um, 
is, is, is any example, you know, any new regulation that's adopted is going to present similar in implementation and enforcement issues. So um, I, I say let's, let's continue using the GDPR. Okay. Um, that's a strong, clear stance. Yeah. All right. Double down on GDPR. Now, um, like to, I would like to change the mood a, bit, a little bit on a more imaginative uh, attitude and ask Justin if he could shape, freely uh, design a new regulation, like let's, okay, GDPR is cool, but it's all the, like the whole panel is leveraging on the, some, like on the lack of specific regulations and therefore we have to look around for, for, for better options. So I would like uh, to ask Justin, like what do we need now and if he could freely shape a, a new regulation, how would it look like to protect workers' rights in digital spaces mostly, or like from surveillance? Uh, yeah, that's kind of a big question. And of course, I was a civil servant, so a bureaucrat, so I'm not exactly imaginative. Um, I, I think the starting point is that, I mean, I agree that GDPR offers a lot, and there have been successes, but in general, I think there's a huge amount of non-compliance as well. Um, and that's for many laws. Like I've seen that, I worked on enforcement in the commission. It's, it's crazy. Like if you look at non-compliance, black holes, where you have no clue what's going on with legislation, and I think in the workplace, that's also true. Um, so for any new law, I would definitely make sure that there's ways in there to kind of create counter power against platform power to help workers organize. That can be financially, organizationally, technically. Um, and in the platform work directive, there are some smart ways to do that. Again, the negotiations are ongoing, so we don't know if that will come out in the end. But for instance, there they have like very clear provisions saying workers should have access to their own communication channels. They cannot be monitored. Um, representatives of workers should have access to workers working for platforms. I think even if they're not, if they're self-employed. So that creates the infrastructure for counter power, for collective bargaining later on. So I think that is very smart. Um, somebody recently mentioned to me that um, what they would find interesting as well is to get access to the APIs so that you have like a much more structural uh, access to the data that's being gathered and um, you know so you have a much better information position that's the stuff that you can put it in a law we haven't done it but it's possible um, so I think that is one um, two and I think it links a bit um, with what um, also what Sana said about like very intrusive surveillance going on, is that um, we need to have very clear pro prohibitions. That's also much easier to enforce than some of the very technical compromise written language that's often uh, in EU laws. And for instance, there again, there's some stuff in the Platform Work Directive that's really positive, right? No processing of emotional, uh, you know, data that can be used for emotional or psychological manipulation. Um, you know, no monitoring of, uh, you know, um, workers outside their working time or when they have private conversations. That was also mentioned, I think, Basana. Um, that's all very clear and that's possible, uh, you know, to just put it in law. And I, would, I think that would help a lot because it's just unambiguous, very clear prohibitions of what can be done. Then you also have, like, um, a link to the data protection regulation. I would, like, prohibit at work any legal base of data processing that's based on consent because workers cannot really consent where they're at work, right? There's a power imbalance. Uh, There's very clear fear of retaliation, so it's very difficult to say no. And when we talk with unions, they say they never do that because it's clearly perceived as a hostile act by the employer. And then they get fired, it's very difficult to prove, et cetera, et cetera. So that would also be very clear. Uh, and I think the third, well, the second one also on um, like collective means of creating counter power is that would make it much more easy to do private enforcement, so collective claims. I think Max Schrems has done this a bit in the consumer area, um, and they've used Article 80 as well in the GDPR, where organizations can be mandated by individuals to represent them in front of DPAs or in litigation in front of the courts. You also have Article 2, uh, well, not Article, but like Paragraph 2 of Article 80, which would allow organizations to do what's called own initiative complaints. So they don't have to be mandated by individuals. That would be super interesting for the workplace because a lot of workers don't want to be identified individually, right? They don't want to step out and be like, yeah, I'll mandate this organization you know, to pros prosecute against my own employer. I mean, 
the retaliation, retaliation risk is obvious. And this has not been implemented, I think, only in Denmark. So I would definitely implement that and create the space for private enforcement because the public enforcement is kind of lagging. So that would be uh, another thing. And then perhaps a bit more speculative, and I end on that, is that I think the technical infrastructure becomes much more important. So this is about standards of software design. And you have a lot of like kind of vague provisions in, in the GDPR, for instance, data protection by default and by design, but also in the new AI Act around data that has to be representative, uh, there has to be kind of a human in the loop principle, but that's all not defined in legislation, right? So it will be standards bodies to decide that. And I think there's probably a lot of scope to get much more active on that. And for instance, we are investigating right now if that's possible on the GDPR, and they have like certification mechanisms that are not very much used, but there's no restrictions on who can create the certification. So if, for instance, workers can get together or a union can set up an, a certification scheme where they say, you know, this is what we want in, in the software that would be compliant with the GDPR from work's perspective, and that's what we'll stamp or seal on, and then you just refuse at a national level, for instance, with the big unions, to just work with any other software. That is real power, and then you can really have some leverage. Again, it's a bit speculative, although there's a lot of like difficulties with doing that, you need a lot of expertise, but that's kind of the direction I would be very interested in uh, going towards. So that's uh, just a few ideas. Great. <laughs> so um, uh, I will close the, this round by asking Aida a bit, uh, again, on this uh, propositive uh, and imaginative thinking, like, what does she, she does what the what sorry what do you uh, uh, see as needed in this ecosystem of organizations that we are talking about for which by the way we lack an identity and the narrative somehow we were discussing this before the talk like we don't have a single word to identify what the four of us are doing and that also kind of reflects in the title it's a word salad of uh, very different things that because also we cannot we don't have a shared identity but let's say there is this ecosystem that is growing who what kind of actors would you like to see more coming into the uh, into this field into this topic specifically and yeah what do you wish to see happening in the future uh, thank you Simone and if I may I would like to push that question to you of course, because you are hearing us, and I'm very interested in what you think about that. But before I push the question to you, I will tell you a little bit what I think. Um, so I'm a huge fan of multidisciplinarity because it's the only way in which the labor movement and workers' rights can really get uh, uh, respected and defended. So um, uh, the actors that we need on the labor, employment, social area are uh, technical actors, but privacy and data protection actors, pri uh, actors related to the human, human rights movement. We are all part of the, same, um, of the same environment, and now more than ever, and I have to repeat myself again, what was said at the beginning, we need to be together because unluckily that the, the laws and regulations that the European Commission is putting out uh, on the digital economy and all the 23 initiatives that I have uh, identified and analyzed, they do not regulate business models. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's the core of a problem. And they kind of more or less give some transparency measures. The AI Act doesn't work for civil society. It doesn't work for workers' rights, so forget about it. We cannot use it at all. Uh, the platform work directive, that it is to improve the working conditions of people working platforms, is going to be trashed because uh, they, the lobbies have managed not to have it. But it doesn't even regulate the business models of digital platforms. It's about improving the minimum working conditions of people there on the streets, so they don't want it. The chapter on algorithmic management, which is kind of the copy-paste of GDPR into finally a labor law uh, piece of legislation, where I think it's quite innovative, is probably going to be watered down, knowing that we have some difficulties in, in, in exercising the right on explanation on, our, on, on GDPR. 
uh, for the platform work directive, what kind of right for explanation a worker is going to have. So all the things that are half-baked bonds in terms of, of regulatory initiatives cannot be, uh, we cannot expect more from regulators at the moment. So this is why we need to <laughs> get together and fill in the gaps that uh, we, already, we all have in our own disciplines and going from from small network to big network, and hopefully the privacy camp next year will be privacy, labor, and other type of disciplines camp. Um, yeah, and, and hopefully you can uh, tell us more what you think about. Yeah, um, yeah, that's also my, let's, let's say, uh, wishes that some people in the crowd here today might consider to, to, you know, switch from whatever topic they're working on. Maybe they're very meaningful stuff, but also like join us and support this, this kind of struggle. And we have around 20 minutes left, I think. And I would like to open uh, uh, the mic to questions, if you have any, for, for, for the panelists or for me. We have one. I think we don't have anybody bringing mics, so I'm going to do it. <clears throat> um, I'd just like to hear more about the reverse engineering, um, the, the way it works. Did you use any kind of specific software um, or was it just kind of <clears throat> general app behavior observation? Just love to, to hear more about that. I can answer some of these. Let me switch role. So uh, first of all, for context, like we had the discussion with Sana that we use the, the word reverse engineering in different ways, but the substance of it is like like understanding this black box that you have on the other side through different means and for sana for what i understood is mostly you know worker interviews and workshops there's no let's say software mean for that in uh, the context of the global project that aida mentioned uh it was uh reverse engineering the mobile app through traffic interception mostly and that means like checking what goes over the network. This is not trivial. Like we have a person specialized in cybersecurity that does that. I'm, I'm a programmer, but I cannot do that. Like it's extremely specific knowledge. Kind of standard in the security field, but relatively new in, in, in this space. So yes, it's that kind of activity. Mobile reverse engineering. Yeah. If you do, you want to know the software? So like I, I can put you in contact with. OK, we can. Yeah. The software was called Frida. Frida is the main one, yes, exactly. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you all for sharing. Um, and really like the, actually the last question of how do you sort of move forward. Um, I think Sana already sort of alluded a little bit in terms of how do you think of yeah, movement building or resistance, particularly because the backbone of the gig economy is usually um, carried by migrant workers, racialized workers. And I find that that angle always sideline a lot when we're talking about some of these things. Um, and I'm just wondering in terms of moving forward also, because obviously even in Europe, um, politically it's moving more right, um, which also means uh, you can also imagine sort of policymaking regulation and sort of like watering down of the platform worker directive is already sort of very clear with that direction, at least for, for a while. So I'm just wondering in terms of yeah, building coalitions and st strategizing. Um, have y'all sort of had um, work, like initiatives, I think, with like migrant organizations or even racial justice organizations that sort of sees labor more holistically and as a part of, say, a form of resistance? Um, and can you maybe share a bit more about that or sort of how, yeah, what kind of steps forward? Because I understand the legal and technical expertise, but I think that also limits it depending on where you situate that. Right. Um, so yeah, just wondering whether any of you can share a bit more about that. Thank you. I, I, I can kind of answer that, but maybe I, I already answered one. Do you want to answer this, like with the diverse collective? No. I, don't know. I can say a couple of things, but I think it'd be interesting to hear your perspective as well, Simone. Um, yeah, um, Jill, I don't have you know terribly. Um, you know specific things to say it's still something we're working on but we are trying to shift some of our efforts towards like very locally oriented organizing where in london we um have a project ongoing with tower hamlets council where we're trying to build coalitions with groups such as like renter unions um 
what else, like anti-raids uh, groups, you know, trying to kind of look at the confluence of issues that this migrant group, migrant wor worker group faces and um, trying to address them holistically. But um, I mean, as always, these are all very under-resourced groups, so it's very hard to say what the impact will be at this moment. Um, but I think that's the vision for how to move forward with this, with this goal. Sana, do you want to say yeah. something? Yeah. Yeah, I can add to it. I think, I think when we think about in terms of power, you know, workers recognizing their powers, I think that's that's not really observed when we talk about migrant workers, especially in platform economy. And migrants do form uh, an important, some say, an infrastructural sort of, you know, they take this infrastructural role in the platform economy in, in Global North, in, in Europe, so to say. Uh, but at the same time, this does not transform into power. And there are various reasons. Of course, there's the structural problems. There's also, you know, uh, people wanting to move into better jobs. And uh, when you do this kind of work, it's also you're not really building any skills. Uh, but I think we also need to talk about the role of trade unions here. I don't know about the rest of Europe, but at least in Germany, uh, traditional trade unions have not been very supportive. And you can't just dismiss and say that, well, you know, workers are, you know, they don't really want to organize. But why don't they? You know, there's different reasons. One of the reasons is also, you know, you don't provide, you, you don't have the sort of like um, uh, uh, services that that could be accessible uh, for, for workers. So say, for example, you know, you don't have the language support, etc. Right. You can't have just a German language support uh, for, for migrant workers. People are new here, they're going to take time. You can't have like a hotline, uh, you know, for workers to call and only provide support in German, right? So it doesn't work like this. So uh, there's different uh, reasons. And I think trade unions and researchers and others also need to actively understand what's going on. You know, we had the case of Gorillas, uh, this uh, delivery company in, in Berlin, uh, where uh, which were mostly migrant workers. And it was, it was very interesting. It turned into a militant sort of organizing. But also, it also showed how workers wanted to, migrant workers actually wanted to make their own union, you know, because they did not have this trust in the uh, in the traditional union. So I think there needs to be more sort of trust building happening between uh, traditional unions. I know there's some efforts being put by unions such as Verdi, etc. But I think more needs to be done in terms of really understanding what's going on. Um, I don't have a lot to share on this, sadly. Uh, but it's a big question for us as well. Like I'm relatively new in this job and it's for us super difficult. Like we have quite a lot of contacts with unions across Europe. Um, and we also try to get in touch with, uh, for instance, migrant workers, which is very difficult for very obvious reasons, right? But I think this is one of the most crucial things because the exploitation is absolutely rampant. It's, it's crazy. It's right, you know, they don't have their own account. They have the subleases of somebody else. So Uber takes 30%, then somebody else takes 40%. You know, they can just not go, they can just not be paid, they have no claims, sometimes they don't have a bank account, they have no legal status, so they will not do anything about that. Uh, and that seems to be increasing as well. There's some recent study came out, I think, last week on what happens in Paris, for instance, so it's, it's huge. Um, I think, speaking from my background at the European Commission, often people in the European Commission, for instance, don't think this is a big issue, they think what they do is extremely progressive. So what I personally think is what I conclude is what we should do is actually take a really hard line to really point out that this is in a way facilitated structurally by how the EU is set up, yeah? how they let certain workers come in, illegal migrants not give them the status, but rely on a huge pool of cheap labor. And that is not coincidental, I think. So it's an infrastructure, right? And to really point that out, because that's not how they see themselves. That's not how I saw themselves and I, I, myself. And I was there, right, when we discussed when this first came up. When we talked about, oh, the sharing economy, this is amazing. <laughs> uh, and that's how a lot of people think. And I think if you take a hard line, they're very susceptible to that because media is very important, their public, public image. And that may also maybe release some resources because they're very sensitive to that. And there's a lot of, there, is a lot, there are a lot of resources available, right? For every law, every initiative, they spend sometimes millions on impact assessments that don't take these crucial issues into account. They do evaluations. Uh, you know, periodic reviews. Now that's happening with the GDPR, for instance. 
And you could, what for me would be super impactful is if somehow civil society and unions can come together and say part of that, of that money, and we're talking really tens of millions per year, should go to civil society to help evaluate the impact of those legislation on specific groups. And then feed that back into the system. That will also allow you then the infrastructure to coordinate and to bring people together. It's a bit abstract, again, maybe wishful thinking, but that's a bit, that was one avenue that I would like to explore. Um, I would like just to, to say that organizing workers is a whole occupation. It's not, doesn't happen just by pushing a button. So I am not an expert on trade union or, or on organizing or on workers organizing. There's people doing this and my colleagues at ETUI are more knowledgeable about that. But I will tell you how it happens. So when in, in Belgium, when the trade unions, the major trade unions knew that they were uh, non-national workers working as platform workers, they tried to organize them. So well, how organizing works is someone from a union goes, an organizer goes to the field, meaning to the meeting place where the riders normally gather, and they stand here, they stay here the whole day saying, approaching the rider saying, in English or in French or in whatever language that person can speak, do you, are you, do you know what a trade union is? Or do you know your rights in Belgium? Uh, do you have a social security number? Basic, basic questions. And that's slowly, slowly trying to, to make awareness or to raise awareness on, on migrant workers that they can be organized, that they can have or can exercise their rights in the country in which they are living. They, they can have a contract and have a pension or access to health services. So that's what organizing is. And I know that the Belgian trade unions have been doing this in the platform work. I also know that in Denmark, Sane, also, uh, I say it to you because I know that you said you were a bit critical with trade unions, but they are doing the work. But this work is going in individuals, organizing manually thousands of workers. It's not fast. It's, you don't see it, obviously. In Denmark, most of the delivery uh, workers are non-national workers, migrant workers, if you like. And the unions in Denmark are trying to do so. So I uh, wouldn't be so critical <laughs> because this work is really huge. It's very difficult to do. And uh, whether it's through a trade union or through another type of coalition, this work is needed. And uh, these national, these immigrants <laughs> uh, need to know that they can be protected wherever they are working. One last question. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about the panel because uh, I think I'm doing very similar work with our organization. So I think we should maybe meet up after the, the talk and talk about it because I think we have a lot of synergies um, to talk about. But um, yeah, I think uh, what we are doing is uh, we are developing a software for reverse engineering that makes it easier for uh -huh. developers, but also for... Uh, non-developers. It's called Tweezel. You should uh, maybe, if you want to know more about that, you can talk to me afterwards. Can you say the name again? Uh, Tweezel. It's like tracking weasel, but without the tracking. I don't know. Um, but I also have two questions because that came up in, in our work. Uh, one is like how to... Um, I, I, like it came up in, 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 in the panel as well. Like how to um, motivate workers to, I don't know, donate their data or um, give you access to the software they are using, the apps and the accounts and everything. Um, like this is, this is one big problem I thought about. And the other thing is, have you thought about like uh, technical defenses, like, um, I don't know, apps or tracking defenses in, like that, that are in software? I know software solutions for social problems uh, are not really popular and also not good, but I still think that there is some merit to it, and maybe you have thought about this as well. I have a quick answer to the second part of that question concerning, um, you know, what, what was it you called it, protections or um, def defenses? Anyway, um, I, I think 
what I have been trying to highlight, or I think what, what all of us have been trying to highlight, is is the intense uh, surveillance these workers are under. So whenever such tactics are deployed, that also brings them, uh, that also gets them into trouble. Sadly, um, you know, we've we've seen instances where workers have gotten dismissed for using third-party apps. Um, allegedly manipulating their GPS coordinates or um, shift grabbers, using shift grabbers if you know what those are, which basically allow them to um, accept shifts on the platform um, in an automated fashion. Um, so the, the companies are very vigilant in, in uh, you know, preventing any activity that the workers might engage in that would give them any advantage over how that platform functions. Um, I think Simone has some things to say. Yeah, I will complement this by saying that in general, when you have a platform or any kind of automated decision making and some workers have this kind of technical response, you are creating a difference of, you know, power between workers. That yeah, it's kind of better than that, but it also it's often at the detriment of other workers. So if you grab the shift, yeah, that shift is not going to go to somebody else. So it it tends not to be a solution. Uh, on the first question, uh, maybe Sana will have something to say, but in general, I can tell you that this uh, like building trust with the workers, it's a of like this kind of workers to get uh, credentials. It's a whole craft. And there are people that are, are doing this, and it's not a trivial problem at all. Actually, in, a, in our experience in reversing works, that's the hardest problem. Like, once you have the, 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 the credentials of the app, like the technical analysis, you know, it's replicable and whatever. But uh, building trust is complicated. What I can tell is that, or better, the most success stories are from organizations that get, that get in touch with workers' collectives not unions, but workers' collectives that are already have the trust of the workers, but also have the means to understand uh, like, you know, the technical implications, the legal implications, like the, the big picture, because this single specific rider that is working you know, 50 hours a week doesn't have the mental energy even to be involved too directly, too immediately in the process. So these intermediate actors are I, like that's their expertise like they have the trust of the workers because they look the same they speak the same they think the same but they can also represent them i don't know if sana wants to add something or yeah very quickly i think um there's also the aspect of non-disclosure agreements you know i mean uh, it's it's not in all kinds of work you know but at least in content moderation and other work which are highly highly secretive uh, it makes it extremely difficult not just to speak with workers, like in, in the sense get access to their software, but also to find workers in the first place. You know, they're not called content moderators, for example. They have these generic, you know, uh, designations, process executive, whatever, whatever. So it's also very difficult to find them and then sort of uh, get access to, to their to their experiences, including including the software. I just also want to say that this surveillance is not just practiced through software. It's also, at least in these, you know, traditional workspaces, it's also practiced, uh, you know, by supervisors, team leaders. So it's it's supplementing that sort of like uh, workplace, uh, the work software monitoring happening. And so, for example, if the workers violate the non-disclosure agreements, there are punitive mechanisms associated with that as well, which makes it really hard uh, to speak to them. Sometimes workers can't even speak after several months after, you know, their employment contract has gotten over. Uh, they can't even put on LinkedIn that they worked for Facebook, you know, so that it, it, it's a whole sort of like a complex uh, construction of, 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 of obscurity that is designed by purpose. We have time for a super quick question. Very simple, very straightforward. Otherwise, we can continue. There is one here. I don't know if it's important. Ah, don't. Thank you. Hi. Super quick. Yeah, uh, uh, because we have been speaking about the collection of data and reverse engineering with um, Frida or something like that. Uh, but we have also been talking about the use of uh, algorithm, like the let's say the server side algorithm, like a profiling algorithm. And um, do you have like a practical case on how you got the source code of the algorithm or how did you evaluate it or how did you manage to uncover it? 
So the source code, you never no. get access to it. So like you're studying a black box. I don't know if somebody else wants to intervene in this. But uh, yeah, unless you have whistleblowers, you don't get access to the actual algorithm. You can make assumptions and have a scientific approach of like thesis and uh, and you know evidence of what's happening behind, but you never get to reconstruct the whole thing. So the legal case must be built on on, on different grounds. I'm not sure if this this is answering what you were asking because you said source code, but in, the, in the, all of these, like you get maybe the mobile app uh, compiled code, like you can reconstruct it. I don't know how technical you are, but that's also not what like most of the things up happen on the server side, not on the client side. So yeah, it's a very different exercise than analyzing source code. I don't know if it's, we can talk about it later, yes. All right, I think time is over and we can close here. Thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you to the panelists, thank you Sana.